Hi, and welcome to our 1030 press conference, Spanning Disciplines to Search for Life Beyond Earth. Our speakers this morning are Jada Arney from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, Stephen Kane from the University of California, Riverside, Catherine Garcia Sage from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the Catholic University of America in Greenbelt, Maryland, and David Brain from the University of Colorado, Boulder. All right, so hi everyone. I am Jada Arney, and I am a planetary scientist and astrobiologist at NASA Goddard. An astrobiologist is someone who studies the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe. And the perspective that I take on this problem, and the perspective that my fellow panelists would take on this problem, is from a planetary perspective. We think about ways that planetary processes can modify and enhance and even cause planets to lose habitability over time. One of the most profound unanswered questions in the history of the human species is, are we alone in the universe? For centuries, we've pondered this question without actually being able to answer it. But that might be about to change because we now know that most stars have planets orbiting around them that are called exoplanets. In the not too distant future, in the coming decades, we'll hopefully have space telescopes that will be capable of searching these exoplanets for signs of habitability and even life. But we can't do these observations yet, because the kinds of information that we're currently able to obtain about exoplanets is extremely limited to very basic properties. We can't actually see exoplanets yet, because we infer their presence indirectly from how they interact with their host stars, allowing us to learn things about the mass of the planet, the size of the planet, and the planet's orbit. And this is useful information for telling us which planets might be habitable, but it's insufficient for telling us which planets actually are habitable. If we want to know which planets are truly habitable, not just maybe might be habitable, we want to be able to see these planets directly to be able to look at their you know, more complicated properties besides just their orbits and their sizes. But this is a huge technological challenge because planets are 10 billion, billion with a B, times dimmer than their host stars. And so if you want to see a planet, you have to have some way of blocking out the starlight. This is kind of like trying to see a bird flying next to the sun. If you want to see the sun, you have to block out the sun with your hand, and then you can see that bird flying next to it. We're developing instruments called coronagraphs that would sit inside telescopes and do exactly this. Coronagraphs would be capable of blocking out the overwhelming glare of the starlight and allow us to see planets that are orbiting around them. But this is still challenging because you have to build these coronagraphs exquisitely precisely. If you have any stray starlight, because stars are 10 billion times brighter than their planets, you're still going to overwhelm your signal from the planet. So we're working on this, and what you're looking at in this image is a simulated view of our solar system from a distance of 40 light years away. The central dark region that you see in this image is the central coronagraph obscuration that's blocking out the light of our sun and allowing these planets to pop into view. So once we have these future space telescopes that enable us to directly image exoplanets, what kinds of information are we going to be able to want to know from them that would tell us whether these worlds are habitable and inhabited? Now, we won't actually be able to get images of exoplanets that look anything like this, much as we would like to, but even from those pale points of light that we're going to be able to obtain, we'll still be able to learn things that will transform them into complex environments. Now, we can't do this yet, but we're currently using computer models to model planetary environments to try to understand what are the different processes that can shape and inform planetary habitability. We're validating these models on solar system worlds because the solar system offers us an example of a whole bunch of planets that are very, very close to us. And we're also using solar system worlds as analogs for exoplanets that we might someday encounter, as you'll hear more about later on in this presentation from other speakers. We live on a planet, the planet Earth, and Earth is a canonical example of a habitable world. It is the only example that we have of a habitable world. And so we can use techniques that we study our own planet to learn about how we could someday measure the compositions of the atmospheres of exoplanets. Because understanding what exoplanet atmospheres are made of is something that we someday want to be able to do. 
what you're looking at in this movie is um, concentrations of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere as a function of time, using a combination of data from orbiting satellites and modeling from the Global Modeling and Assimilation Office. We can't see carbon dioxide with our eyes, but carbon dioxide and other gases do interact with light at very specific colors or wavelengths. And so even from space, even with satellites orbiting around Earth, we can measure these interactions between gases and light and infer how much of these gases are present in the atmosphere of our planet, as you see in this video. We can use these same techniques, this technique called spectroscopy, to measure the compositions of the atmospheres of exoplanets. By measuring the composition of exoplanet atmospheres, we'll be able to learn whether they may be habitable or inhabited. Probably the first gas that we would look for when searching for signs of habitability on a planet is water, because water is central to our definition of planetary habitability, and it's really where we start when we talk about the search for life in the universe. So that's how we might identify habitable worlds, but how do we actually go about detecting life? That's a much bigger question. And one way we can do this is by thinking about what are processes that life does that can modify its environment. Because in some ways, life is a planetary process that can modify its environment on a global level. And some of those modifications can be detected from many, many light years away. For example, we're all taking advantage of the fact right now that life is a planetary process because we're breathing oxygen. And the oxygen that we're breathing was produced by photosynthesis. If you were to go back in time about 2.5 billion years ago, you would find that you wouldn't be able to breathe the air. There was no oxygen in our planet's atmosphere. It took the evolution of photosynthetic organisms and the subsequent rise of oxygen in our planet's atmosphere to be able to you know, have the atmosphere that we know and love today. So life can really have a profound impact on the planetary environment. And when we look for life on exoplanets, one thing we could do is look for these metabolic byproducts that are produced by life that are called biosignatures that we could detect in the atmospheres of exoplanets that would be indicative of life, gases like oxygen and methane. But if we see something that we think might be a biosignature, we really want to be sure that we really know what we're looking at because it's going to be complicated to interpret that biosignature. So we'll want to consider that gas in the full context of the planetary and stellar environment to think about all of the kinds of ways, all of the sources and sinks of that gas that could produce it or destroy it. So in our quest for life elsewhere in the universe, we truly have to take an interdisciplinary framework to consider these planets holistically from the perspective of multiple interacting planetary systems and stellar processes. We can learn from Earth science, which gives us a framework for what a habitable world looks like. We know that star-planet interactions are extremely important, as you'll hear more about in this presentation. We know from planetary science how different planetary processes can shape habitability. And lastly, we can learn from astrophysics how to discover these worlds. And so now I'm going to hand it to Stephen, who's going to tell you in more detail specific ways that we're doing this within our solar system. Thank you, Jana, and thank you everyone for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Kane from UC Riverside, and I have been studying exoplanets for almost 25 years. And during that time, uh, we have discovered uh, thousands of exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And the, the way that this has progressed is shown in these graphs, which you can see, which are showing the mass and the sizes of these planets that we have found. And when we first started doing this several decades ago, we started finding the giant planets first because those were the easiest to find. Uh, but as time has gone on, we have become better at finding planets, not just in terms of the numbers, but in terms of our sensitivity to smaller planets, uh, terrestrial planets. And in particularly in the, in the panel on the right, you can see the yellow points, which are the discoveries from the Kepler mission, which are really probing deeply into the terrestrial regime. And so now uh, we find ourselves at a time when uh, exoplanets, the community is discovering many planets uh, which are rocky. This is, of course, very exciting in the context of the search for life in the universe because some of these planets, uh, there's a particular, some highly publicized uh, discoveries from the Kepler mission which are within the habitable zone of their host stars, which is the region where 
we suspect that, that water could exist. Uh, and so this is showing an example of some of the Hubble zone uh, planets discovered by the Kepler results. However, there's something that we need to be uh, acutely aware of, and that is that it, to a very large extent, the exoplanet community are not planetary scientists, but rather they are stellar astrophysicists. We use techniques to find these planets which don't directly uh, detect the planet itself, but rather the effect the planet has on the star. And so most exoplanet folks uh, are very uh, w good at understanding the star, but not so much the planets. And, and in particular, when it comes to habitability, knowing the size and the mass and how much uh, energy that that planet receives from the sun is not nearly sufficient to be able to understand what the surface conditions may look like. Uh, for example, the atmospheric composition, the reflectivity of the cloud decks of the planet, the rotation period, and the tilt of the axis, of the, the rotational axis of the planet, uh, these all greatly influence the way in which the energy received at the top of the atmosphere is redistributed around the planet. And of course, all of these things, the atmosphere and the rotation and the tilt of the Earth's axis have a profound effect on the climate of the Earth and the seasons that, that we see. And so the question is, can we measure these obviously very important planetary properties for other planets. And the way in which to do this is to, of course, go back here to our own solar system. And uh, starting with the Earth. Now, studying the Earth as an exoplanet and a habitable planet is, of course, uh, not a new endeavor. This is something that we've been doing for many, many years. But what we are now able to do is to try and simulate the Earth as an exoplanet using relatively new spacecraft. There is one spacecraft in particular called Discover. Uh, this is a satellite which is located about a million miles from the Earth, directly between the Earth and the Sun. And it is designed to measure the activity of our Sun and also to measure the radiation budget of the Earth itself. And one of the very useful and not intended uh, aspects of the data from Discover is that it is continuously pointing at the Earth for long periods of time and it is a distance where we see high resolution images of the Earth on a single detector and it's been uh, in flight for several years now and so we can now truly study the Earth as an exoplanet. And just to show you what that looks like, uh, the image on the left is a, a, a pure image fr from the Discover satellite from a camera called EPIC. And it uh, takes these pictures about once every half an hour and, as I said, has been doing so for the past several years. What we do is that we take these beautiful pictures and we degrade them horribly uh, to the point where it's only a handful of pixels. And the reason that we're doing this is because, as Giada mentioned, we won't be able to take pictures of uh, planets that look like the picture on the left. They're going to look much more like the pictures on the right. And the question is, what can we do with that? And since we understand the intrinsic properties of the Earth very well, this is a perfect test bed for us to understand what it is that we can do. So what we have done is that we look at an individual pixel uh, from the image on the right, and we are able to extract the rotation period of the Earth, the tilt of the Earth's axis. We can even see the effect of Hadley cells uh, over seasonal variations. And so uh, this has been used as critical input into mission design for coming missions which will be able to, uh, able to directly image exoplanets. And even though it's only a handful of pixels, we can still extract the data that we need to fully understand what is going on at the surface of these planets. Now, the Earth is, uh, of course, our, our best and only example of a habitable planet, but we need to go a little further than that because we have another example of an Earth-sized planet, and it's a very uh, nefarious thing to keep in mind when, when you see uh, results that describe planets as Earth-size, 
then that's equivalent statement to saying that the planet is Venus size. And of course, if you say that a planet is Venus size, it has inc incredibly different connotations. I sometimes refer to Earth and Venus as the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of uh, terrestrial planets. What can happen when you have planets which probably had very similar starting conditions, but took very different pathways, in particular in the evolution of their atmospheres. When we look at the surface of Venus, and this is one of the pictures from the Russian Venera missions that landed on the surface, uh, and we know that the surface pressure is about 92 times the atmospheric pressure of the Earth, the temperature is about 850 degrees Fahrenheit, and there's sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. In fact, you could think of Venus as being the opposite of a habitable planet, a completely inhospitable world. And so, since we are finding these planets, uh, that are uh, the size of the Earth and also the size of Venus, the question is how do we tell the difference? That is obviously of critical importance before we start attributing habitable labels to these planets for which we only know the size much of the time. And so part of the uh, effort going forward will be to gather more data on Venus to understand the differences between Venus and the Earth. How often does a planet uh, become a Venus-like environment and not the environment that we know and love for the Earth. And so going forward, an important part of our work, our multidisciplinary work, uh, will be to understand the differences between Venus and Earth and trying to detect how many Venuses there are out there in the universe. And lastly, I just wanted to emphasize what Giada was saying about the multidisciplinary work. A key part of this is, as I said, I'm an exoplanet person, have been for decades, but we are at a particular time in history now when the exoplanet folks uh, are being forced, sometimes kicking and screaming, to the table of multidisciplinary uh, work and collaborating with our planetary science, our geophysics, our climate science, and biology colleagues in order to understand the planets that we're finding. So thank you, and I will now hand over to Katie. Thank you. I'm, I'm Catherine Garcia Sage, and I'm a heliophysicist at NASA Goddard and at Catholic University. And heliophysics is the study of interactions between the sun and the earth. And these interactions follow two basic pathways. Um, on the one hand, there's radiation from the sun, and things like ultraviolet radiation and uh, solar flares that you may be able to see in this movie is uh, bright flashes of light uh, that die away quickly. Um, and the other pathway of interaction is the solar wind and any solar storms that the sun decides to send our way uh, that interact with the Earth's magnetic field and uh, can affect both processes in uh, near-Earth space and processes in the upper atmosphere of the Earth and the ionosphere. Um, and these processes uh, many of them turn out to be invisible, so the only way we can study them is by physically flying a spacecraft around the planet uh, to look at these interactions. And it turns out that Earth is the easiest planet to study in this way. Um, and so we can learn a lot about Earth, but then apply what we've discovered to other systems, both in the solar system and at exoplanets. Um, and these sun-planet interactions or star-planet interactions affect habitability um, partly through the radiation. Uh, and it's sort of a fine line that a little bit of radiation uh, may actually help to provide the basic building blocks of life. Uh, but a lot of radiation at the surface of the planet uh, could mean that life can't exist. Um, and also these interactions affect the atmosphere of the planet. Um, and it, it used to be the common wisdom that uh, um, if a planet had a magnetic field, 
that that magnetic field could form a protective bubble to protect the planet from the stellar wind, uh, like we see here, the contrasting examples of Earth with its protective bubble around it, and Mars with the solar wind coming and stripping away the atmosphere. Um, and Dave Brain will speak in a minute about what we can learn from studying Mars. Um, but it turns out that we can't just look at the planet. We also have to look at the environment of the star that, uh, that the star creates near the planet. Uh, so if we have a brighter star, uh, like the diagram at the top here, uh, there's the habitable zone, which could also be called the temperate zone, uh, because it mainly depends on temperature and whether temperatures are right for liquid water. Um, and this zone is farther away for a brighter star uh, as compared to the sun. And then for a dim M dwarf or red dwarf star uh, shown at the bottom, the habitable zone is very close to the star. Um, but this turns out to have another effect because M dwarf stars tend to be very active, um, have a lot of stellar flares, um, a lot of ultraviolet radiation at habitable zone distances, and a very strong stellar wind. Um, and so we uh, can take what we know about these sun-planet interactions at Earth. Um, and based on studies at Earth, we found that for a magnetized planet, there are three main processes that can affect escape of the atmosphere. Um, one is ionization that uh, creates the source population for um, particles that can escape at the north and south poles of the planet. Um, energization and escape rates. Uh, and finally, the polar cap size, which is the area over which these ionized particles can then escape from the atmosphere into outer space. Um, and here I'm showing a movie of one of these processes where you can see the ionization occurring, uh, the yellow ions and green electrons separating out. And because the electrons are lighter, they can escape the planet's gravity. Um, the ions may be too heavy to escape by themselves, but with the electrons escaping, it creates a mag a electric field that can then draw the ions along with it. And this can produce escape even of heavier ions, uh, like oxygen, that may otherwise be uh, too heavy to escape the planet's gravity. Um, and so what we did was we took our model of these processes at Earth, and we uh, put it in the location of Proxima Centauri b, which is a planet that's in the habitable zone of the M dwarf, Proxima Centauri. Um, and we found that those three factors, the ionization, um, escape rates, and polar cap size would all increase. Um, and that drastic increase in the escape of the upper atmosphere could then uh, lead to the escape of the entire atmosphere of the planet within the planet's lifetime. Um, and it turns out that an uh, atmosphere is important for life. It's important for retaining liquid water. Um, and so if we want to know whether a planet is habitable, we need to uh, take into account space weather effects, because these can have a profound uh, effect on the atmosphere of a planet. Um, and so now Dave Brain will talk about what we can learn about these processes um, at Mars. OK, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Dave Brain. I'm a professor of astrophysical and planetary sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm a planetary scientist by training, um, but my research overlaps the heliophysics type topics that you just heard Katie talk about. 
Um, and I've been working with a spacecraft mission called MAVEN that's been in orbit around Mars for the past three years, examining um, through measurements today what we might be able to learn about the habitability of Mars through time and whether there was a transition in the atmosphere um, that was substantial enough to account for a change in habitability of that planet. There we go. Um, and so uh, the point has been made that uh, we don't have the kind of data that we need right now about uh, rocky-sized exoplanets around other stars, but we have a wealth of data about rocky planets in our own solar system. And so the, the trick here is to take the planets that we've studied well and use the lessons that we glean from studying planets like Earth, Venus, and Mars, and apply those lessons to the situations that we think are occurring at planets around other stars. And so uh, one thing that I study is atmospheric escape, how atmospheric particles can be persuaded to leave a planet's atmosphere or forcibly ripped away in some cases. And uh, MAVEN has been giving us observations of this process for the past three years. And so Katie talked about a magnetized planet, Earth, I'm going to talk about an unmagnetized planet, Mars. And in this sense, Mars is one of our nearest laboratories for studying unmagnetized exoplanets around other stars. OK, so that was um, sort of the motivation. But what did we actually do as a group? And uh, what we did is a group of us um, thought about how we could apply the lessons that we're getting from MAVEN about how the Martian atmosphere has evolved and take those lessons and apply them to exoplanets. So we imagined a situation where Mars, um, instead of orbiting our own star, orbited a different kind of star, an M dwarf star or um, a red dwarf star or an M star. They're called all of those things interchangeably. But what if it orbited one of these stars? And the motivation for picking this type of star is because many of the um, recent exciting announcements about exoplanets, uh, uh, for example, the TRAPPIST system or Proxima Centauri b, are around uh, these M dwarf stars. And also, our technology in the coming years may be um, best suited to detecting planets around this kind of star. And that's because these stars um, are generally smaller than our sun and dimmer than our sun. And so they obscure your attempted observations of the planet less. And there are, there's a wide variety of M dwarf stars in terms of size and activity level. Um, but generically speaking, if Mars orbited an M dwarf, it would have to orbit much closer to that star to even have a chance of being habitable. And by habitable, I mean um, have a temperature at its surface that's appropriate for water to exist in liquid form stably. Therefore, the Mars-type system, as you can see from the diagram on the top, um, would fit very neatly well inside the orbit of Mercury in an M dwarf system. And if, Mar if we kept Mars at the outer edge of the habitable zone of that star, um, then Mars would receive roughly the same amount of sunlight from the star that it does in our own system. So that's where we have to place Mars for it to even have a chance. However, as Katie said, uh, M dwarf stars can be much more active than our sun. They can have more intense flares and more frequent flares and more intense and frequent solar storms early in their life cycle. And some M dwarf stars can be relatively quiet as well. But in general, the amount of ultraviolet light and the amount of particle radiation coming from that star would be greater um, relative to the energy from just the sunlight than it is in our own system. So by moving Mars in, we've kept it um, maybe warm enough for water to be liquid, but we've exposed it to a big hair dryer of processes that want to take that atmosphere away. OK, atmospheric escape is not just one process, as MAVEN has been studying for the past three years. It's a whole series of processes. And I'm going to take about 17 minutes on each of the next five processes as I describe them. Or instead, I'm going to flip quickly through about five slides and let them wash over all of us. Um, and so this is first to set the stage. There's energy coming from the sun in terms of light. And the extreme ultraviolet light is the important light for energizing particles at the top of the atmosphere and ripping it away. And there are also particles coming from the star, the stellar wind. Um, the planet itself has neutral particles in the atmosphere. And that atmosphere can be very extended at Mars because it's small and doesn't hold on to its particles as well. And some of those particles gain a charge through interaction with sunlight and are ionized. And then magnetic and electric fields tell them where to go. 
So Maven has measured each of the escape processes independently and not only um, started to tell us how much is escaping from Mars, but what the knobs do on those processes. How sensitive are the knobs and what knobs are important for controlling the processes. So we can apply those lessons to the MDORF or the M star situation and here are about five processes that occur. Number one, particles can escape in ionized form or in charged form. We call this ion escape. With more um, light coming from the star, that creates more charged particles in the atmosphere, and therefore more particles leave. More energy in, more particles out. So this would increase for Mars by a factor of three to five around an M dwarf star, a quiet M dwarf star. Next, photochemical escape. This is for neutral particles, and sunlight drives chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Okay, more sunlight in, more charged particles are created, and those charged particles start the chemical reactions. Again, the amount of photochemical escape would increase in the M-dwarf situation by maybe a factor of 10 for even a quiet M-dwarf star. Next, uh, a fireworks type process called sputtering. It's actually a pretty simple process. You have particles that are ionized, um, far from the star gain a charge, and then magnetic and electric fields tell them how do they move, and some of them go crashing in to the atmosphere and splash new particles out. We've created more ions when we orbited an M-dwarf. More particles are going to go crashing into the atmosphere. You're going to get more particles out as a result as well. This process would increase. Finally, um, th uh, thermal escape. This is for neutral particles as well, and this is a more subtle point um, here, and it was harder for us to think about. But hydrogen, um, hydrogen atoms would escape at a greater rate, we think, around an M-dwarf through a combination of the added energy from the star and the increased chemistry that would um, go on deep down in the atmosphere, leading to hydrogen getting to the top of the atmosphere and then being able to escape. So all of these together that we've considered individually, when you take them together, it all points to increased atmospheric escape around an M-dwarf star for unmagnetized Mars. And this is just for a quiet M-dwarf star. But if we consider an active M-dwarf star that's flaring all the time and very energetic, then the escape rates could increase by as much as a factor of several thousand in this situation if you're unlucky enough to be born around an active M-dwarf star as Mars. Okay, but not all hope is lost. We've considered a particularly difficult situation, but it's a situation for which we had really great data and really great observations from our own system. But say it wasn't Mars, say it was a bigger planet, uh, like Stephen talked about, like Venus, that might be better able to hold on to its atmosphere. Maybe it's a, a planet that's still outgassing today from inside, and so in addition to the atmosphere being ripped away, there's atmosphere being added. That's maybe a happier situation as well. And then um, through the types of processes that Katie is thinking about and I'm thinking about too, it might be that a magnetic field is a good thing for a planet to be able to retain its atmosphere. So not all hope is lost for rocky planets being born around M dwarfs, but it looks like if Mars today were born around an M dwarf, it might not end up so habitable at the end. So with that, I'll turn it back to Giada to uh, close out. So just to wrap up, um, the main message that we're trying to convey is that interdisciplinary science is really the future of understanding exoplanet environments. These planets are going to be understood in a very data-limited regime, even when we finally get direct observations of them. And so by using this interdisciplinary framework, we can learn a lot more about these environments than we would be able to otherwise. We know from Earth science we have a framework for understanding what a habitable environment looks like. We can use planetary science to think about these planetary processes that shape habitability. And we've used Mars in our own system, solar system to think about atmospheric loss processes. We've also used Earth's twisted sister Venus to think about how a planet that's superficially similar to Earth in many ways can end up on a very, very different path and be totally uninhabitable. And lastly, we know that we can't forget sun-planet interactions because how stars interact with their planets really can determine what happens to a planet's atmosphere and can even strip away the entire atmosphere, as we heard about for the case of maybe Proxima Centauri b and also for Mars around an M-dwarf. So thank you, everyone, and we'll be happy to now take questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, questions, please state your name and affiliation, please. Oops, sorry. Hi, Harvey, to kill me. 
Seth Borenstein, the Associated Pre uh, Press. Let's start with Gianna. Um, in terms of, if you look at the catalog of uh, potentially habitable planets, those in the Goldilocks zone, <laughs> um, and then you look at the distance from here, I mean, you sort of just rained all over the parade of uh, Proxima B here, <laughs> um, and you take into effect how many of them are M dwarfs and how many of them are not. Uh, if you look in the next 10 to you know, 20 years, how many of that already small sample size would we be able to have enough technology, resources to characterize atmosphere, magnetic field, the things you need? So let's say 10 years from now, or even 2030, let's say. Mm -hmm. How many of those planets could we glimpse enough to tell that, oh, they're not just in the habitable zone, but we see what we need to see? Mm -hmm. To determine which of those planets are actually habitable, not just potentially habitable. So that's a really great question. Um, so speaking to the small sample size we currently have, we do have some missions coming online in um, just next year, we have the TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which will look at a whole lot of stars all around the sky, mostly MDORFs, and that should increase our numbers of, you know, habitable zone planets that we know about. We'll have soon the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be able to make observations of transiting exoplanets, planets that pass directly in front of their stars. You may have heard of the TRAPPIST-1 system of planets. That's a uh, um, eight planet system that has some planets that are in the habitable zone. And James Webb may be able to make observations of that system. Um, Proxima Centauri b is unfortunately not transiting, so we unfortunately would not be able to observe it with James Webb. But in the more distant future, um, we would like to be able to turn to direct observations. So the coronagraph technology that I talked about. Um, there's the potential to do that from ground-based observatories, particularly for MDORFs, to do it for more solar-type brighter stars, so really look for Earth analogs around Earth analog stars like the Sun, much brighter than these MDORFs. We um, probably need, um, at least for the first generation of observations, space-based telescopes. So there's um, uh, some designs that are currently being considered by uh, NASA headquarters has directed the community to study the designs of these observatories for um, consideration for the next generation of flagship missions. They um, include a mission concept called HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Imaging Mission, as well as the LUVOIR concept, L-U-V-O-I-R, which stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. Um, so both of these concepts would be designed to directly image exoplanets and would be capable of um, blocking out the starlight and searching them for signs of habitability and life. And so I think that's really going to be our first and best chance if we get one of those observatories to see exoplanets around sun-like stars directly. And I guess for um, maybe David or Katie, is this almost time? I mean, you said there is some hope for M dwarfs. How constrained do you have to get? You know, how, many, how much do you have to twist in a pretzel to get an M dwarf plan, uh, star that has a planet in the habitable zone that's close enough to get enough warmth, but not close enough to get ripped away in that hair dryer effect? And I mean, and then you factor in what percentage are quiet compared to active. Are we really, I mean, are we talking maybe, you know, there's so many M dwarf systems we're looking at, we're talking one or two percent that we think of in the habitable zone might actually be really possible, or are we talking 50 percent? I mean, just a sense of how real these figures are for, for possible habit, habitability. Okay, I'll start. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't think I want to give a percentage because I have no idea. Um, but let me, let me try and answer it a different way. I can imagine a variety of scenarios in which you could get um, a habitable terrestrial planet around an M-dwarf. Um, you know, with the experiment that we've done, if you got a quiet M-dwarf, then even for little unmagnetized Mars that's not outgassing, the the duration of habitability for that planet is reduced by a factor of maybe five-ish at the low end. Um, and if it's an active planet, then the period of habitability could be reduced by a factor of thousands. 
But say Mars today was habitable for a billion years, and we don't know that that's true, then around an M-dwarf, Mars today would be habitable for 200 million years. Now when we start adding back some of these other mitigating factors, and we use the plot that Stephen showed earlier that says that there are plenty of rocky type planets that are even bigger than Earth that are being discovered, I think we can get into a regime without too much difficulty where um, we can talk with a straight face about whether that planet is really habitable at that point. Uh, another thing to note here is that um, planets orbiting that close to their star have a good chance of being tidally locked through tidal interactions with the star. Um, and that, in our own solar system, we're finding can be a source, an additional source of heat for the insides of planets. So there may be even an advantage in the Endorf situation for getting extra volcanism to add atmosphere and things so like what that. What does that do in terms of life if you've got tidally locked and you're on the other side? Yeah, so there are, there are all sorts of thought experiments that you have to do and pros and cons that mm -hmm. you have to consider, but at least from a retaining an atmosphere perspective, you know, there are all sorts of things that you could think about um, that might lead to increased duration of habitability for terrestrial planets that aren't exactly Mars. Yeah. And I'll just add that this is, well, <laughs> excuse me, this is one of the reasons why we really need uh, to continue promoting this interdisciplinary science, that we need you know, people like geologists who can tell us about you know, volcanism and how that adds to the atmosphere. And we need um, people who understand the whole evolution of the planet, that if it started out with a much larger atmosphere than what Earth started out with, then that would be a pathway to it retaining uh, more of an atmosphere and, you know, continuing to be habitable. Um, that we sort of need experts from all of these subject areas to even begin to answer that question. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any questions on the chat? Okay, fine. Leave a question from Eileen Klotz, who is a writer for ABC I think that's a really great question. Um, I think certainly big data can help with these problems in term of, terms of, you know, data mining the da these, these data sets that we're going to be getting from observatories that will be discovering exoplanets. But um, I don't know any of the specifics of that. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, also one community that, that didn't get mentioned in the question would maybe be earth science or or geology, and I think that's a particularly important component here as well. Any other questions? Seth? So, listening to you all, it sounds like, you know, a, a, as the astronomers come out and say, look at all these wonderful exoplanets, so many in the habitability zone, ex bringing up all the excitement. And you guys come and seem to sort of rain on the parade and say, <laughs> OK, now that we look at it from other points of view, there's less and less of it. Of course, you need an atmosphere to rain on the parade. Um, is there anything that when you bring in the uh, non-astronomers in the field, instead of saying, wait, this makes it less likely, is there anything that these new interdisciplinary studies come in and say, OK, you're not looking at it this way. This brings in, you know, expands the habitability zone or makes it you know some more likely i mean are you all just you know debbie downers here or is there anything you're adding that makes it a little more optimistic well so <laughs> uh it, it can sound like that we're just being completely pessimistic about this but it's it's really uh just about adding information to our first order effects uh now in terms of the habitable zone, for example, uh, the habitable zone as a concept has, has been around since the 1950s and things like that. But uh, it's, it, it was just based on the luminosity of the star, and it was during the 90s that 
folks like Jim Casting started, had the computational power to apply climate models to this. And so a lot of that has been based on, on uh, very rough estimates just from the Earth and from the star. Uh, what, uh, what we're seeing at the moment is, could be considered as uh, growing pains of the field uh, because uh, as we've seen over the past couple of decades, uh, we've seen incredible growth in this field. Uh, and from the exoplanet perspective, it's just been this fire hose of data uh, for, and new planet discoveries that we're trying to, to understand and it's, and it's very difficult uh, to keep up. For example, when we talk about Proxima Centauri system or the Trappist system, we're already a stage where we're thinking, oh, that was three or four habitable planets ago, you know. It's, and so um, the, the uh, very subtle effects of the effect of the M dwarfs, the effect of the intrinsic properties of the planet is, uh, is, is just something that, that frankly we're, we're trying to keep up with and understand these effects. But to, to address your specific question about do any of these effects actually improve habitability, then, then yes, there, 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 there are uh, various effects that people have thought about that uh, actually increase the extent of the habitable zone. For example, if it has a, uh, a, a hydrogen layer, perhaps either a primordial uh, upper layer to the atmosphere or something which has been outgassed from the planet, then that could extend the outer edge of the habitable zone further out because the, uh, it would increase the, the, uh, the greenhouse trapping of infrared radiation at the surface of the planet. Uh, there are also geological cycles that we're uh, understanding more now and applying to exoplanets where you have uh, the thermostat on an exoplanet that would retain long-term climate, climate stability where we wouldn't normally otherwise consider that as something which would retain habitability over long time scales. So it's a bit of a tug of war backwards and forwards about these different effects, some of them positive, unfortunately some of them negative. The reason that I actually think that um, uh, this sounds particularly negative is because we have focused on M dwarfs. M dwarfs are very controversial because they are so active. There's issues like tidal locking. Um, the methods that we're now using to discover pl planets are biased towards those kinds of stars. This is why they hit the, the, uh, the discovery space and the media uh, outlet so often, because that's where we're exploring. Uh, as time goes on, we will be finding more planets around um, stars more like the sun, where we, we won't necessarily have to uh, be such Debbie Downers, as you put it. <laughs> and just last one for me is, okay, so for each of you, given what you're seeing, what exoplanets out th are out there in the habitable zone that still look promising to you at this point after all the stuff you're talking about? I mean, for example, you know, my, my colleagues and I, is, should we be excited more about the Trappist system or the Proxima B system? I mean, it seems like now neither, I don't know. Um, what one, for each of you, what are the, what are the exoplanets in the habitable zones that, that still make you think, hmm, maybe there. Mm -hmm. you go down the line? Um, well, is this on? So um, I am a very optimistic person, actually. And I am s really excited by both the Trappist-1 system and the Proxima system. I know that there are barriers to habitability of both of these systems, but we can actually observe both of these, especially the TRAPPIST-1 system in the near term. So we'll be able to test our hypotheses that we have of these worlds pretty soon and find out what they're actually like, which I find really quite tremendously exciting. Um, what I'm personally the most excited about is the little bit more distant future when we can actually start imaging Earth analogs around sun-like stars. That's what um, really gives me goosebumps thinking about what might be out there around these um, brighter sun-like stars that we haven't yet been able to tap into that population as Stephen was talking about. Uh, so one thing that's, that's come up uh, during this Q&A is, is about the, the numbers that you were asking about. And, uh, an important piece of that is that we are at a particular threshold of massive amounts of new discovery with tests being launched next year, JWST. And so um, even with the, it, it seems like the, there's a, a lot of planets that are, that are being reported in the Hubble zone and that's certainly true, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we can expect in the years ahead to have many, many more of these kinds of planets, not necessarily around M dwarfs. I uh, tend to cancel out Giada's optimism. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, 
the, the, a lot of what's been said now about the the trapper systems is that because of what, what we've heard in the, in this session is that uh, the effect of mdorfs uh, can have profound influence on the ability of planets to even retain uh, an, an atmosphere for long periods of time. But I hold my breath until we actually test this, and this will be uh, this will be in the years coming up when we'll be able to, uh, not necessarily for Proxima Centauri B because it doesn't transit, but for the Trappist system, various other systems that will be discovered by TESS, the, it'll really lie in whether we observe the effect of, of an, an atmosphere, or that, that it has an atmosphere. As I mentioned, that may, may simply mean that it's a Venus, <laughs> <laughs> which is another pathway, but, um, but that's, that's the thing that we have to really test for. I think uh, that wraps up our press conference. We're out of time, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, next up is the Explaining Extreme Events. Thank you. <laughs>